The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson Murder, Magic, and Madness at the Fair that Changed America Evils Imminent A Note from the Author In Chicago, at the end of the 19th century, amid the smoke of industry and the clatter of trains, there lived two men, both handsome, both blue-eyed, and both unusually adept at their chosen skills. Each embodied an element of the great dynamic that characterized the rush of America toward the 20th century. One was an architect, the builder of many of America's most important structures. Among them, the Flatiron Building in New York and Union Station in Washington, D.C. The other was a murderer, one of the most prolific in history and harbinger of an American archetype, the urban serial killer. Although the two never met, at least not formally, their fates were linked by a single magical event, one largely fallen from modern recollection, but that in its time was considered to possess a transformative power nearly equal to that of the Civil War. In the following pages I tell the story of these men in this event, but I must insert here a notice. However strange or macabre some of the following incidents may seem, this is not a work of fiction. Anything between quotation marks comes from a letter, memoir, or other written document. The action takes place mostly in Chicago, but I beg readers to forgive me for the occasional lurch across state lines, as when the staunch, grief-struck Detective Geyer enters that last awful cellar, I beg forbearance, too, for the occasional side journey demanded by the story, including excursions into the medical acquisition of corpses and the correct use of black prince geraniums in the Olmsteadian landscape. Beneath the gore and smoke and loam, this book is about the evanescence of life and why some men choose to fill their brief allotment of time engaging the impossible, others in the manufacture of sorrow. In the end, it is a story of the ineluctable conflict between good and evil, daylight and darkness, the white city and the black. Eric Larson from Seattle Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Daniel H. Burnham, Director of Works, World's Columbian Exposition, 1893 I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. Dr. H. H. Holmes, Confession, 1896 Prologue, Aboard the Olympic, 1912 The date was April 14, 1912, a sinister day in maritime history, but of course the man in Suite 6365, Shelter Deck C, did not know it yet. What he did know was that his foot hurt badly, more than he had expected. He was 65 years old and had become a large man. His hair had turned gray, his mustache nearly white, but his eyes were as blue as ever, bluer at this instant by proximity to the sea. His foot had forced him to delay the voyage, and now it kept him anchored in his suite while the other first-class passengers, his wife among them, did what he would have loved to do, which was to explore the ship's more exotic precincts. The man loved the opulence of the ship, just as he loved Pullman Palace cars and giant fireplaces, but his foot problem tempered his enjoyment. He recognized that the systemic malaise that caused it was a consequence in part of his own refusal over the years to limit his courtship of the finest wines, foods, and cigars. The pain reminded him daily that his time on the planet was nearing its end. Just before the voyage, he told a friend, quote, This prolonging of a man's life doesn't interest me when he's done his work and he's done it pretty well. End quote. The man was Daniel Hudson Burnham and by now his name was familiar throughout the world. He was an architect, and had done his work pretty well in Chicago, New York, Washington, San Francisco, Manila, and many other cities. 
he and his wife Margaret were sailing to Europe in the company of their daughter and her husband for a grand tour that was to continue through the summer. Burnham had chosen this ship, the RMS Olympic of the White Star Line, because it was new and glamorous and big. At the time he booked a passage, the Olympic was the largest vessel in regular service. But just three days before his departure, a sister ship, a slightly longer twin, had stolen that rank when it set off on its maiden voyage. The twin, Burnham knew, was at that moment carrying one of his closest friends, the painter Francis Millet, over the same ocean but in the opposite direction. As the last sunlight of the day entered Burnham's suite, he and Margaret set off for the first-class dining room on the deck below. They took the elevator to spare his foot the torment of the grand stairway, but he did so with reluctance, for he admired the artistry in the iron scrolling of its balustrades, and the immense dome of iron and glass that flushed the ship's core with natural light. His sore foot had placed increasing limitations on his mobility. Only a week earlier he had found himself in the humiliating position of having to ride in a wheelchair through Union Station in Washington, D.C., the station he had designed. The Burnhams dined by themselves in the Olympic's first-class salon, then retired to their suite, and there, for no particular reason, Burnham's thoughts returned to Frank Millet. On impulse, he resolved to send Millet a mid-sea greeting via the Olympic's powerful Marconi wireless. Burnham signaled for a steward. A middle-aged man in knife-edge whites took his message up three decks to the Marconi room adjacent to the officer's promenade. He returned a few moments later, the message still in his hand, and told Burnham the operator had refused to accept it. Foot sore and irritable, Burnham demanded that the steward return to the wireless room for an explanation. Millet was never far from Burnham's mind, nor was the event that had brought the two of them together, the Great Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Millet had been one of Burnham's closest allies in the long, bittersweet struggle to build the fair. Its official name was the World's Columbian Exposition. Its official purpose, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. But under Burnham, its chief builder, it had become something enchanting, known throughout the world as the White City. It had lasted just six months, yet during that time its gatekeepers recorded 27.5 million visits. This when the country's total population was 65 million. On its best day, the fair drew more than 700,000 visitors. That the fair had occurred at all, however, was something of a miracle. To build it, Burnham had confronted a legion of obstacles, any one of which could have, should have, killed it long before opening day. Together, he and his architects had conjured a dream city whose grandeur and beauty exceeded anything each singly could have imagined. Visitors wore their best clothes and most somber expressions as if entering a great cathedral. Some wept at its beauty. They tasted a new snack called Cracker Jack and a new breakfast food called Shredded Wheat. Whole villages had been imported from Egypt, Algeria, Dahomey, and other far-flung locales, along with their inhabitants. The street in Cairo exhibit alone employed nearly 200 Egyptians and contained 25 distinct buildings, including a 1,500-seat theater that introduced America to a new and scandalous form of entertainment. Everything about the fair was exotic and, above all, immense. The fair occupied over one square mile and filled more than 200 buildings. A single exhibit hall had enough interior volume to have housed the U.S. Capitol, the Great Pyramid, Winchester Cathedral, Madison Square Garden, and St. Paul's Cathedral all at the same time. One structure, rejected at first as a monstrosity, became the fair's emblem, a machine so huge and terrifying that it instantly eclipsed the tower of Alexander Eiffel that had so wounded America's pride. Never before had so many of history's brightest lights, including Buffalo Bill, Theodore Dreiser, Susan B. Anthony, Jane Addams, Clarence Darrow, George Westinghouse, Thomas Edison, Henry Adams, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, Nikola Tesla, Ignaz Paderewski, Philip Armour, and Marshall Field gathered in one place at one time, 
Richard Harding Davis called the exposition, quote, the greatest event in the history of the country since the Civil War, end quote. That something magical had occurred in that summer of the World's Fair was beyond doubt, but darkness, too, had touched the fair. Scores of workers had been hurt or killed in building the dream, their families consigned to poverty, fire had killed 15 more, and an assassin had transformed the closing ceremony from what was to have been the century's greatest celebration into a vast funeral. Worse had occurred, too, although these revelations emerged only slowly. A murderer had moved among the beautiful things Burnham had created. Young women drawn to Chicago by the fair and by the prospect of living on their own had disappeared, last seen at the killer's block-long mansion, a parody of everything architects held dear. Only after the exposition had Burnham and his colleagues learned of the anguished letters describing daughters who had come to the city and then fallen silent. The press speculated that scores of fairgoers must have disappeared within the building. Even the street-hardened members of the city's Whitechapel Club, named for the London stalking grounds of Jack the Ripper, were startled by what detectives eventually found inside and by the fact that such grisly events could have gone undiscovered for so long. The rational explanation laid blame on the forces of change that during this time had convulsed Chicago. Amid so much turmoil, it was understandable that the work of a young and handsome doctor would go unnoticed. As time passed, however, even sober men and women began to think of him in less than rational terms. He described himself as the devil and contended that his physical shape had begun to alter. Enough strange things began happening to the men who brought him to justice to make his claim seem almost plausible. For the supernaturally inclined, the death of the jury foreman alone offered sufficient proof. Burnham's foot ached, the deck thrummed. No matter where you were on the ship, you felt the power of the Olympics' 29 boilers transmitted upward through the strakes of the hull. It was the one constant that told you, even in the staterooms and dining chambers and smoking lounge, despite the lavish efforts to make these rooms look as if they had been plucked from the palace of Versailles or a Jacobian mansion, that you were aboard a ship being propelled far into the bluest reaches of the ocean. Burnham and Millet were among the few builders of the fair still alive. So many others had gone. Olmsted and Codman, McKim, Hunt, Atwood, mysteriously, and that initial loss, which Burnham still found difficult to comprehend. Soon no one would remain, and the fair would cease to exist as a living memory in anyone's brain. Of the key men, who besides Millet was left? Only Lewis Sullivan, embittered, perfumed with alcohol, resenting who knew what, but not above coming by Burnham's office for a loan or to sell some painting or sketch. At least Frank Millet still seemed strong and healthy and full of the earthy good humor that had so enlivened the long nights during the fair's construction. The steward came back. The expression in his eyes had changed. He apologized. He still could not send the message, he said, but at least now he had an explanation. An accident had occurred involving Millet's ship. In fact, he said, the Olympic was at that moment speeding north at maximum velocity to come to her aid, with instructions to receive and care for injured passengers. He knew nothing more. Burnham shifted his leg, winced, and waited for more news. He hoped that when the Olympic at last reached the site of the accident, he would find Millet and hear him tell him some outrageous story about the voyage. In the peace of his stateroom, Burnham opened his diary. That night, the fair came back to him with extra clarity. <laughs>